Professor Pell is the executive director of the Kerwin Institute on the Study of Race and Ethnicity uh, at Ohio State. He is also a chair in Civil Rights and Civil Liberties. He has, among other things, advised the governments of Mozambique and South Africa. And um, I have known John for uh, many years and often find him as the iconoclast uh, in every audience I'm in, willing to challenge what the rest of us are doing. So I have seen John most recently at a conference at Yale on gay and lesbian parenting. But while we were there, he, he was talking about something near and dear to his heart, far more central to his work for the last 20 years, which is the issue of housing. And the question of how in this crisis, what seems to have gotten lost is the impact on the people who have been most victimized by the financial crisis. Without more, John, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you, Joan, and thank all of you, and I uh, thank uh, the law school for hosting this conference. Um, I can't wait to uh, see and read and some of the stuff that's coming out of it. So, as you can see, I have a computer up here, a big computer, not an iPad or anything like that. Although Joan told me that um, uh, as uh, one of the ways that which the school is going to express your appreciation for my coming here, you give me an iPad, so I really appreciate that. <laughs> Just kidding. Uh, so, I, I do have a PowerPoint, um, and uh, uh, I, I unfortunately told uh, the wonderful uh, host that at the last moment, so it's not, you're not going to be able to see it, uh, at least not at this point. And I won't stick to it, but I, I'm, I'm going to use it just as a way of orient, orient my thoughts, and then um, uh, make it available to you later. So I'm going to be talking a little bit about uh, the crisis. And there's some things that I wish I could show you, so I'll describe them to you briefly. Uh, in some ways, we sort of have had a long history of a dual housing market. And we know that. And that housing market has now uh, revealed a dual credit market. Uh, and if we sort of think about the credit market and the housing market together, we sort of understand um, both the crisis, but also the failure to actually fix the crisis. And so, uh, one of the things that you think about the housing market in the United States, going back to the 1930s, before the 1930s, we had a two-party uh, two system in terms of mortgage. Uh, so, a lender uh, and a borrower. That was it. You go to a bank or savings and loan, and, and you would uh, take out a loan, and oftentimes you have to put 50% down and amortize the loan within five years. Obviously, under that arrangement, especially in the 1930s, there were not many people who actually could avail themselves of that. So the United States government stepped in and changed the housing market and the mortgage market. And it became a three-party system, and it worked relatively well until about the 1970s or 80s. <laughs> now, in terms of moving to that three-party system, um, it also created uh, some other structures around it including a national appraisal system uh, and, and the, the precursor to Fannie and Freddie Mac, uh, the GSEs that are now under attack. Uh, but in terms of setting that up, again, in the 1930s, and this is before Brown, and this is still when we had a pretty explicit uh, Jim Crow laws, uh, the system was set up really to uh, work for white Americans and not for non-white Americans. And so we had uh, very explicit laws and rules and uh, practices as to who this market was for. And we, so we set up this housing market and credit market that was largely uh, deeply racialized. And we actually uh, created national redlining. Uh, basically, the federal government, in order to get the, um, the insurance for the federal government, we tell the banking industry, here's the underwriting rules you have to follow. Um, and in terms of doing that, you have to follow this appraisal system, um, and which uh, requires essentially redlining. And they actually created maps. Uh, and I have some of these maps on my computer. I can tell you, they're really beautiful. Uh, uh, but uh, these maps, which were redlining maps, um, every neighborhood in the country uh, was basically uh, put on these maps. And one of the 
things that was important in terms of these maps was this language that came out of uh, the underwriting manual. I'll read the language. It says, if a neighborhood is to retain stability, it is necessary that properties shall continue to be occupied by the same social and racial classes. A change in social or racial occupancy generally contributes to instability and decline in value. So, so this is the federal government basically saying, you know, if you want our money, we got to keep these neighborhoods homogeneous. Now, it's actually worse than that because it's not homogeneous in that we want all black and all Latino and all white neighborhoods. Really what they meant was all white. And so if you had uh, blacks, and in some cases even other groups like Jews, uh, you got less than uh, the, the gold standard, uh, the green. You had, you had something in between. There were four standards, with red being the worst. Um, and so to actually facilitate this, the federal government also then started helping uh, 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 underwriters and then the realtors develop model restricted covenants. Uh, and so it's basically saying, how do, how do we discriminate better, more effective? Uh, and so the federal <coughs> government stepped into the breach and helped us develop um, uh, restricted covenants, which my guess is, if many of you looked at the covenants today, you would probably still find remnants of restricted covenants in place. Uh, so that created a sort of a template for our, our market. And out of the template, as you know, we shifted from a, um, a 50% down, five-year mortgage to a 10% uh, down, in some cases nothing down, 30-year uh, mortgage. And that became the housing market. And that really actually propelled, uh, was one of the most important things along with the GI Bill, that then created the middle class. We, we hardly noticed that this middle class, that was actually the largest middle class in the history of the world, and very ro robust, was primarily white and male that these strictures, at the very time that they were creating this new mechanism, uh, was doing it in a racially coded way, and to some extent, in a gender coded way. So of course you'll know that uh, Bill Clinton, President Clinton talked about the GI Bill being the most important piece of legislation to create the modern middle class. Uh, and the GI Bill was quite important in terms of uh, uh, people going to school, in terms of houses, in terms of, uh, in terms of um, uh, uh, businesses, it really uh, catapulted America into the forefront of an economic power and exploded the middle class. Uh, and again, until fairly recently, most people didn't notice. Of course, if you wanted, wanted to get the GI Bill, and there's a famous case called the Finney case, 98% uh, of GIs were men. So right away, you sort of exclude most women. And the military was deeply segregated. And if you were able to actually navigate around the segregation of the military and get in, if you're African American, after you got out, when you're going to use these things, where are you going to use your new mortgage? Where are you going to go to school? Uh, schools were highly segregated. So again, this is a very racialized system uh, that largely uh, was left intact. And then, of course, there was the Shelley versus Kramer case that basically said, or the court said, we're not going to enforce these restricted covenants. It didn't say they were illegal. It simply said they were not going to enforce them. Uh, and uh, so we continue to have this practice. And this practice initially strongly supported, underwritten, and informed by the federal government got picked up by the private sector. Uh, and the private sector continued to sort of follow this. And I would say, to some extent, continue to follow it even to the day. So uh, now let's sort of fast forward to like the, the 1970s. And the 1970s was the first time we started seeing introduction of mortgage-backed securities. Uh, and um, Fannie and Freddie got into the, the, the picture, but they got into it in a relatively small way. This was not uh, a big part of their portfolio. And then you had private uh, mortgage-backed securities that did get into it in a big way. And they exploded. And they started really eating up the market shares of Fed and Franny. Uh, and Fed and Franny basically said, you know, what about us? You know, this is, this is the new way of doing mortgages in the country. And it's not that mortgage-backed securities are necessarily bad. Uh, it was a way of actually uh, taking advantage of some of the things that was happening in terms of globalization and in terms of investors uh, all over the world. Uh, but there also started to be uh, a, a different pieces of that, including the subprime uh, uh, expression 
and even what some people call predatory. Now, the, the, uh, in order to understand subprime, we have to understand a couple of things. The first of all, subprime was uh, really the epicenter of the subprime loans was the black community and the Latino community. Uh, more than twice as likely to get a subprime loan if you were black. Uh, in certain neighborhoods, because this was all done, also done at a geographic level, five times more likely to get a subprime loan if you lived in a black neighborhood, regardless of your race. Uh, and uh, so, in a sense, the, the banks were saying, we don't really quite know how to make these loans, and because of the changes in the laws, uh, starting in the 1970s and moving on, you had non-depository banks coming into, into the picture. These banks were not regulated uh, by things like CRA and others, uh, and they became big players. Um, and they started pushing these uh, subprime loans. And the Wall Street Journal, in a couple of articles, mentioned that in, in a number of cases, more than 50% of the people who got subprime loans were actually eligible for prime loans. And the, the high risk associated with these uh, loans was in the loans themselves, which again, is sort of a lot of people miss it. It wasn't necessarily in the borrower. The, the, the loans themselves were structured uh, for high risk and high returns. And so brokers were incentivized to actually produce subprime loans uh, because they would get more money off of subprime loans, off of fees and other things. Banks, as you know, uh, because of the way they were securitized, didn't hold the loans very long. So they became pass-throughs. Uh, the, the driver of it really became the secondary market, which was so taking these loans and uh, cutting them up and selling them. Now, if you think about what was going on in uh, 1970s, 1980s, and 1990s, until today, so we had this, this sort of new set of instruments not being regulated, uh, a lot of money being made off of it, and a global phenomenon. Uh, the thing that's interesting about it, though, a number of things that are interesting, is that the epicenter of it was the black and Latino community. And one might say, why? Uh, we have to go back to the 1930s and 40s. Sometimes people refer to subprime loans as reverse redlining. That is, uh, the communities that were most in need of mortgages and that was not fully mature, uh, fully mature markets, were the communities that had been locked out in the 1950s and 60s. This was the black and Latino community. The same communities that had been locked out now became the target of subprime loans. And um, a case involving Wells Fargo, where they made it explicit to their lenders, we want you to produce subprime loans in the black community. Uh, you got bonuses for doing that. Uh, and more recently, uh, Goldman Sachs got into the picture where they uh, asked for subprime loans to be created. And they went further than that. They actually worked with physicists to create an algorithm uh, that people would not understand, including Wall Street investors. They wanted these loans and these instruments to be obscure. Uh, and in Goldman's case, they actually produced these securitized subprime loans and bet against them. They bet that they would fail. So they made money when they would fail. Uh, and um, the SEC actually sued them and they settled the suit. Uh, but it was clear that what they were trying to do was not just defraud homeowners, but defraud, defraud investors. My concern with uh, that suit was that the SEC and the federal government stepped in on behalf of the unsophisticated, uneducated Wall Street investor. Uh, it did nothing for the homeowners. There's been no suit involving the secondary market uh, in terms of homeowners. And there are provisions under the Fair Housing Act and the Fair Credit Act that would allow this. But not one suit to date has actually been on behalf of homeowners, uh, but instead on behalf of investors. Now, uh, I mentioned that we had gone from a two-party system in the 30s to a three-party three system. And in terms of <coughs> complexity, a two-party system is not simply twice as complicated as a, a three-party system is not simply twice as complicated or 50% more complicated than a two-party system. It's five or six times more complicated than uh, a two-party system. Uh, but it worked relatively well, again, like I said, until the 1970s or 80s. Uh, but today, 
we have not a two-party system, but by some people's account, a 50-party system. Uh, and that system is so complicated that actually no one really understands it. Uh, there are so many uh, ways in which the, the money moves around and, and, and uh, uh, securitized and cut up uh, that even the most sophisticated um, uh, person doesn't understand it. In fact, I think it was uh, um, uh, Ben Benicke, someone looked at one of his mortgage and they had something in there and they said, what does that mean? He said, I don't know. Uh, and here's the guy who said the Federal Reserve Board. Uh, so the point is, is that these complicated mortgages that are being pushed into the black and Latino community, it's not really reasonable to think that you can educate lay people to actually understand these mortgages. And in fact, uh, if lay people could have understood them in the 19, 2007 and 2008, uh, the originators would have worked very hard to make sure they couldn't understand it. That was the whole point. So it wasn't simply unsophisticated investors. Um, so uh, the deregulation from the 1970s and 80s actually made the subprime uh, market possible. Uh, in that process, what we've seen is that the subprime market grew from 1993 to 1999 by 900%. It became uh, a major player uh, in the market. Um, and, and as I said already, in, in 2007, the Wall Street Journal noted that 55% of people with subprime loans uh, actually were eligible for prime loans. And that many of those loans, if they had been prime, uh, they would have performed well. Uh, so part of the crisis was in the subprime loans themselves, uh, not simply in the population. So here's a, a, another map I have on uh, my computer, which I'll make available to you, that if you look at the epicenter of subprime loans and the epicenter of redlining, same place. Uh, so you look at the maps of where redlining was most robust in the 1940s and 50s and look at communities that have been most hard hit by uh, subprime loans and foreclosures today, it's the same communities. And so there's a direct line between what we were doing then uh, and what's going on now. Um, and part of this, of course, is, a, is also about a narrative, a story. So I was just at an event a, a month or so ago where uh, the uh, uh, Federal Reserve Board is considering new rules and new regulations around the credit system and around the GSEs. And, uh, and this is online, and, and I'd be happy to share it with you. But the banking community was there basically saying, the problem is not with Wall Street, and certainly not with banks, uh, but with these unsophisticated borrowers who never should have gotten loans. And, and, they, and they've produced a 100-page paper calling for Treasury and FEC to stop distorting the market. And they say that civil rights laws, fair credit laws, a CRA, uh, 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 Title VIII, should not apply to loans. That they're asking for, they're lobbying, they're pushing for not even a, not even adhering to the existing laws, but making the existing laws worse. And they and they acknowledge that if they do this, they will lock out uh, the black and Latino community and a large part of the white community. And their position is these people shouldn't be in the market, and that's what caused all the problem. And so let's not just have a a dual credit system. Let's make it explicit. Um, and if they are to get loans, have them go to the federal government under, under FHA. They should not be in the private market at all. We should not be hamstrung by these civil rights laws uh, that make it hard for us to do our bidding. And, uh, and I've said this, what, what is their bidding? Um, and um, if you think about it, think about the fights about banks uh, at the beginning of the country, the early 1900s. The whole point of banks, uh, especially federal banks, was to actually make loans available to people so that the economy would work. The purpose of banks, they were chartered for a public purpose. The purpose wasn't to make as much money as possible. The, the, the purpose was to make the economy work for people. Now we have a system where banks unabashedly say, you know, we're not here for people. We're here for ourselves and other banks. Um, and I think if, if they push that 
long enough and hard enough, we just say, okay, no more banks. Uh, because they're still getting all kinds of benefits. They get discounts, they get protection, they get insurance. Uh, so in some ways, they are backed up by the federal government, but they don't want to have to participate with those uh, bothersome people called citizens. Uh, and it's a really a strange system because essentially when I was at this all-day meeting at Federal Reserve Board, there were probably 400 people there, uh, a number of speakers, maybe 50 speakers, uh, and I literally think that two of the speakers, me and Jim Carr, were the only people of color out of this whole array of people. Uh, and, uh, and so we're pushing back as hard as we can, um, but I'm not hopeful, although I must say, with a, with a nod to the uh, Occupy Wall Street, it's actually turned people's attention again to the banking industry in a way that I think is quite useful. No matter how or what happens with that movement, they've been brought back into the discussion, and I think in a, in a useful way. And since then, I've been contacted directly and indirectly about by a number of large banks, I, I won't mention their names, uh, saying, you know, we'd like to do something in the black community, maybe you could help us. Like, uh, but they wanted to be all voluntary, uh, not to be required to uh, do anything uh, by the federal government. There's been a number of uh, programs looking at the stripping of wealth from the black community as a result of this. And I'm sure all of you are aware of the explosion of the wealth gap which was about 10 or 11 to 1 between the black community and the white community, and then now it's gone to 20 to 1, uh, and 18 to 1 between the Latino community and the white community, which is interesting and disturbing on a lot of levels. And when you think of uh, uh, George W. Bush, one of his programs was to try to increase home ownership to decrease the disparity between the black community and the white community in terms of wealth. We have no discussion of that now, and in fact, this this explosion and the banking community solution is, so be it. Some people will be locked out of the market. Um, and I work closely with uh, the administration, particularly HUD. Even Secretary Donovan has sort of said, OK, we may have a two-tier system, a system of renters and a system of homeowners. Uh, what he doesn't say, but he obviously knows, is that this would be racially coded. So we have some people who will never be able to accumulate wealth if the housing market takes off, and other people who would. Um, I think we have to uh, push back on this. I think we have to figure out a way in which we actually have not just a unitary school system, if we ever get there, but a unitary housing system and a unitary credit system. Um, and uh, working with La Raza and others, there are a number of civil rights groups now uh, trying to push for just that. But it's difficult because credit is complicated. Um, and, uh, and part of that complexity tells us, I think, what some of the goals should be. What are some of the goals? That, well, I think, first of all, we can't have a tort approach to credit. It's much too complicated, and it's much too big. Uh, and I say to my students, credit is to money as money is to bartering. Uh, if you don't have access to credit, either individually or collectively, you can't effectively participate in our society anymore. Uh, and it creates a structural inequality for those who don't have access to credit. So how are we to fix this? First of all, I think we have to affirmatively make credit available in ways that are appropriate to all of the markets, all the populations in the country. Uh, we have to actually do it in a way that moves us to a unitary credit system and starts to um, uh, address this huge disparity in credit. Um, we have to figure out the right instruments uh, and the right tools now, the Consumer Financial uh, uh, Advocacy Agency could be very important in this way if it ever gets off the ground. Uh, but there is going to be a pushback. There are going to be people who say, no, this is more regulation. Um, and some of you may know the book um, by Hardcore, which is the illusion of um, uh, unregulated market. There's no such thing as an unregulated market. It never has been and never will be. The question is, what are the regulations? Who are they supporting? Who are they not supporting? It's not conceivable of having an unregulated market. And yet, uh, that's all you hear. Uh, and so I think what I'm suggesting is a couple of things. I have some specific remedies, but I don't want to get too specific, and this is why. It's too easy to game the system. Uh, and so what we really need to do is to actually have something like uh, the 
uh, consumer finance credit agency and have some outcomes that we want. Uh, that we actually measure our success by outcomes and certain values. So as soon as we put down a specific rule and think that's going to fix it, uh, all those smart people coming out of physics and, and, and these <coughs> schools like here will figure out how to game it. Uh, because there's so many pieces that one particular uh, uh, intervention can easily be worked around. Now there's some things that are being talked about, as you know, that are quite disturbing. For example, things like um, creating a system where banks need to hold uh, mortgages, uh, whether it's 5% or 10%. Um, and it's not necessarily a bad idea. The idea is that banks has become a pass-through. Once they're pass-through, they have no incentive to actually make sure the loans are safe long-term, the idea of having skin in the game. Uh, but then they would have an exception or qualified qualify residential mortgages. Uh, mortgages where they would not have to hold any percentage of the mortgage for the length of terms. So you have one set of <coughs> mortgages where the banks have to hold, another set where they don't have to hold. So if you're a bank and you're told you have to hold 5% <coughs> if you make loans to these folks, and nothing if you make loans to these folks, you're going to the folks where you don't have to hold. Uh, again, it incentivizes creating a two-tier system. So while we, we want the banks to be responsible, and also we want not just banks, traditional depository banks, but everyone who's in the game to be responsible in a way, uh, we should not do it in a way that actually ends up reproducing um, a two-tier system. Uh, I have a lot of charts here about the difference between uh, uh, how this difference actually plays out uh, between race, uh, and, uh, and some suggestions. But I'm going to just close because I want to have some time for uh, questions and comments. That this effect uh, in terms of racialized mortgage market doesn't just affect individuals. Because of our segregation and housing patterns, it has a huge effect on whole neighborhoods. And as you know that when you have a foreclosure uh, in a, uh, on a certain neighborhood, certain, it affects what they call the spillover effect. It affects all the houses around it. So the spillover effect is much more pronounced, again, in the black and Latino community. Uh, Congress has taken, taken note that there are certain communities hit harder than other communities at the state level. So there are, are some special provisions that if you're a state, like maybe if you're uh, uh, head of the Senate and you live in Arizona, not Arizona, Nevada, you might say Nevada deserves special dispensation because we hit harder than some other state. We've done it at the state level. We have done nothing like that at the neighborhood level. We have not looked at how this crisis, which affects all of us, is racially uneven. And so one of the things that I have to is that we should extend that principle that we're not all even situated within this. The goal should be to get everybody on their feet, but the goal should have a credit system where everyone can participate, that's inclusive. But in order to get there, and I call, I call this targeted universalism, the goal is universal. Everybody in the credit system, everybody have access. The strategy has to be targeted. The strategy has to be targeted based on our different situatedness. Uh, and that will have sometimes have racial implications, sometimes that will have geographic implications. There will be rural white America that will then benefit from this. But we just can't have a system where uh, uh, we're actually uh, formally, uh, in our practice, excluding uh, large numbers of people. Um, <coughs> see if I have anything. There's <coughs> the last thing I'll say. <coughs> As you know, there's a big fight about you know, among the GSEs. Should we have Fannie? Should we have Freddie? When you read the government's report, and the White House has a report out, and they're going to have another one out, they talk about the role of the private market in terms of creating this problem. And then they come up with three possible solutions going forward. Two of the solutions basically says, thank you, Let's get the government out of the housing business, not the finance business, and turn it over to the private market. <laughs> and, and literally, when, when my staff read this, it's like, this is crazy. They just say that the problem largely was situated. And there's enough blame to go around for everybody. 
uh, but was largely in the private market. And so the solution is, let's turn it over to the private market. Uh, and uh, the third is some kind of hybrid. Um, my position and our position is that we're not necessarily trying to save Fannie and Freddie, but this system worked relatively well uh, for 50 years, um, and even worked well uh, in this crisis for prime loans. It was only the subprime loans that actually pulled the market down. Uh, so um, so uh, we had this blip, and the blip was largely driven by Wall Street and by the banks. Uh, and it doesn't make sense to say we're now going to trust them to, to actually do this right. Uh, so whether we have Fannie and Freddie, we need some sort of government involvement in this, uh, uh, or some sort of incentive structure for the private market to make sure that we have a unitary um, housing system uh, and a unitary credit system. Uh, and, and, and now it's not just in the United States, it's global. So we also have to think about how the securitized mortgages uh, will be impacted on a global level. So with that, let me stop and open up for questions and comments. job guarantee program be necessary for uh, having a, a global credit system? And not necessarily. I mean, obviously, I'm, I'm sure many of you know that the initial cause of the, set of, the, of the housing and credit problem was really housing itself. Now, a lot of the, the problem associated with uh, the crisis is actually unemployment. So obviously, the two feed off, off each other. You do have to have people participating in the economy in an effective way. And not everyone's going to work. Uh, even under a healthy economy. Um, and uh, we haven't figured this out. I mean, part of the thing that, uh, and there's a whole debate, for example, how do you spur the economy? Do you do it by spending more, having more jobs, consuming more, or, or do you do it by cutting, and trying to get to uh, a balanced uh, budget? Um, and I think that, you know, obviously it's, it's going to end up with some of both, and a lot of this is ideological from my perspective. Um, but yeah, you do need a robust economy, and you need a, a, a real serious safety net. You do need uh, for protection for people who are on fixed income uh, and, and other things. But you don't necessarily need everybody working. Uh, again, this worked relatively well for 50 or 60 years, and we've never had an economy uh, where everybody works. So that's not really what's required. Uh, what is required is that, like I said, you do need a robust economy, and you do need what I call shared uh, responsibility and share uh, burden and benefits. So it's distributed in a way that makes sense. We can't let certain populations opt out. Uh, and, uh, and share at risk. I mean, as you know, and a number of people have said that what we've done is to uh, privatize the profits and socialize the risk. Uh, so we can't do that. We, we can't, um, you know, there's that cartoon that was in the New York Times uh, a few months back where a couple of parents are talking to their kid, and they say, so, uh, Johnny, what do you want to be when you grow up? He says, too big to fail. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you know, and if, if we're too big to fail, then it has to either be broken up or regulated. Uh, because we're saying this is, this is something that's so important to the economy that we can't allow it uh, to, to go down, then we have to actually make sure that the right strictures are in place. Bank of America's principal advisor in Germany, Herr Henkel, is their equivalent of the head of the um, uh, business roundtable plus the Chamber of Commerce put together, and he's stepped down. And he said that the U.S. crisis was driven by the fact that we could no longer redline. So he actually wants to go back to redlining and then signs on to the very racist discourse about Turks and everything else in the German context. And I can't get anybody excited of that uh, one of the largest banks in the world has an openly racist uh, principal advisor in one of the largest nations in the world. 
Um, any hope for forming some effective coalitions and pushing back ourselves? We talked about pushing back the other way. Well, I think that's quite important. I think it's implicit. I mean, I'm, I wouldn't. I didn't know that this person had been so bold as to be explicit. Most people are smarter than that. <laughs> uh, but you know, I mean, he was probably in Germany, so probably better to say. But uh, two things. One, I think that race is actually much more important to, in terms of going forward, in terms of understanding what's going on. There's a whole other lecture I give in terms of corporations and and why we're not until recently focusing more on corporations. And I think that there is uh, strong evidence, robust evidence, that the country is going through tremendous racial anxiety. And that one of the ways you sort of understand what's coming out of much of the Tea Party, and I'm not saying the Tea Party per se is racist, but I'm saying they're feeding off of racial, racial anxiety. And so it's the, the idea that the other is really the other. And rather, and, and uh, Jeffrey Sachs and, and Tim Weiss and uh, Robert Putnam have talked about the growing diversity in Europe and the United States is maybe the number one threat to stabilize mature democracies. Because what you see happening is that as, as these populations become more diverse, uh, there becomes this anxiety, and then it becomes withdrawing from public infrastructure. As the public becomes more diverse, it's like, well, if, if and you saw this with Prop 13 in California, you saw it in Arizona, uh, and no one says it. No one says, all these Latinos, I'm not going to pay for them to go to school. There is a book called Other People's Children, which talks about that. Um, we have to engage that for, uh, forthright. We have to really talk about a country where, where uh, uh, people belong. I mean, that's sort of the, the underlying message. I mean, it's amazing to me that literally, you know, it's not an easy thing to change the Constitution. But people are talking about doing away with the uh, birth clause out of the 14th Amendment to make sure that these others don't become U.S. citizens. Um, so I do think we have to engage this in a very important way, and I've, I've been writing some about this, um, but I think, you know, people might have been confused as to why uh, all the hostility after the financial crisis was directed at, one, the government, um, and two, unions and teachers and, you know, uh, uh, anybody, but not corporations. They got, they got a free pass, uh, which is sort of amazing. Uh, so again, I sort of take my head off to the Occupy Wall Street because they've turned our attention and say, hey, wait a minute, how did these people get this free pass? And a lot of it can be understood in terms of racial anxiety. Um, I think we have time for maybe one more question. Thank you. Um, I understand the danger of the argument that um, to the effect that some people uh, uh, should be allowed to own a house and some people not. And so these, these other people arguably would, would rent. There are some studies recently that have shown that even the majority of the people who own a house, including um, white people, have all their savings, all their money in the house and have nothing else because they believe that you know their the value of their house is going to rise and you know they're going to come bold and, and even better but but that's not the case that's really not the case and this whole crisis has shown that that it's not the case that they have the mercy of something and the reason that they invest in their house is because they don't make enough money in their in their job so isn't it also a question of our economic system. I mean, when people don't have jobs that pay enough to really live. Well, that's exactly right. And I should be clear. You know, uh, most of the most of Europe, not you know, uh, don't have the kind of housing structure that we do. We probably overinvest in housing. So I'm not opposed to saying we shouldn't have uh, our, our major wealth building structure uh, should be housing. What I am saying is that we should have one system for whites and one system for non-whites. That's what I'm objecting to. Uh, and it may be that, well, we go to a European system where we have, people have their wealth in other forms. Now, you're exactly right. The assumption was, and the assumption was actually a, a reasonable assumption for, since the 1930s, that the housing market in the long run would actually appreciate it. Alan Greenspan, who at the time was considered the smartest economist in the world, uh, said before the crisis, that we couldn't have a national housing bubble. 
he actually incentivized the investment in housing, not just by people in the United States, but by the global economy. He actually discounted uh, investment in treasury notes because he wanted to direct money into the housing industry. So this wasn't just people making decisions. We actually structured for trillions of dollars to go into the housing market based in part on the assumption that the housing market may, you may have local bubbles, like here in Kansas, but not a national bubble. So this was the, the, the smartest <coughs> economist in the world was saying this to the public. He said it to Congress. Uh, now, all of us make mistakes, but when I make a mistake, it doesn't bring the world economy to its knees. Uh, and you know, this is a huge mistake. So you're right, and part of the reason that we've been investing in housing and taking um, the equity out of the housing is that since 1975, uh, for the most um, elite group, not really the most elite group, because I think we actually have a three-tier system uh, with whites, the middle stratum, the non-whites below them in terms of political, and the elites. And oftentimes, we don't pay attention to the elites. Uh, so, but in terms of that middle stratum, uh, white males, income have been stagnant since about 1975. In fact, if you look at the data, the gap between white men and white women is actually declining, not because women are doing better, but because men are doing worse. Um, and the first iteration in terms of fixing our stagnant economy, our stagnant wages, was for the man and the woman to say, honey, you gotta go to work. <laughs> uh, but honey's already working now. Uh, and so we sort of exhausted that. So the next thing was, well, we got we have this house, and we got all this, equity in the house, let's take some of the equity out of the house. We'll catch back up because the house will continue to appreciate. And even Alan Greenspan says that, but that turned out to be false. Uh, now, we might say we have to do something because we're spending too much or whatever, but during most of this period of time, from about 1975 to 2005, the economy doubled in size. So the most part of the time, it wasn't that the economy wasn't growing, is that the distribution of the growth was captured by the 1%. Uh, and so, unless we, and, and I'll stop because I see June is grabbing her purse. Uh, <laughs> the, in, in 1975, corporations paid about almost 25% of the national budget. Now it's seven. Last year, a third of corporations paid nothing. Uh, General Electric, which is one of the largest corporations in the country, actually got a $4 billion refund. Uh, and, and in the 1980s, economists were saying, that's not sustainable, that if we shift our tax burden from wealth and from the elites to working class Americans, we can't sustain that. Um, and that's exactly what we've done. Uh, and so we do need, I mean, it's a much larger discussion uh, of, of how we actually participate. And as I say this, and I've written about this, and I'm not anti-corporate, but I do think we have serious corporate misalignment. And, and they need to participate, not just in the, 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 the benefits, but in the cost in the infrastructure of the country. And if we don't do that, we're on toast. <laughs> Wearing my economics professor hat, I have to say that I've never heard a more withering indictment of economics than the idea that Alan Greenspan was the smartest of <laughs> <laughs> Wearing my Wolverine hat from that school up north, I've always wanted to be able to bring maize and blue to an Ohio Stater. <laughs> These are actually our colors, though, at University of Missouri, yes. And thank you very much, and this is by the local artist about Kansas City. We bill ourselves as the urban school, by the way. Thank you. And I must say, it's just a beautiful campus. I wish I had time to explore it more, but thank you.